Hello and welcome to the Build Up in association with Labrooks. I'm your host, David Gillick, and I'm joined by Labrooks ambassador and former Ireland international, Kevin Doyle. Kevin, how are you keeping today? Very good, David. Very good, thank you. So, you, you mentioned something there. It was either last week or the week before that um, it's there's going to be a few more twists and turns in the run-in to the Premier League title. And who blinked first? Well, it was Liverpool. Uh, that draw won all with Spurs. Um, you know, when you look at City and how they have responded from the Champions League disappointment, it kind of looks like it's City's to lose now. Would you agree? Well, it is theirs to lose, but I still think there'll be one more little twist in it. Um, you know, they have a tough game this weekend against West Ham as well. It's not. There's no easy game. Listen, they played really well uh, last night, in particular um, watching that game and. It's, in fairness to them, from that massive disappointment of the Champions League, they've bounced back with two good results. So, um, But that's not, to be honest with you, the Premier League, as great as it is and all, that's not what they were wanting to win. So they were wanting to win the Champions League and and um, they haven't done it again. So it really is a disappointment for them and this, you know, win the Premier League for them is just something they've done over the last few years anyway and it's not, I suppose, as big a deal for them at the moment. Um, but yeah, I still think there'll be a twist. Um, I think it'll be interesting to think you go down to the last day. Like you kind of look at like you, you mentioned a bit of a disappointment, you know. It like is it hard for say the club Man City, like Pep Guardiola's come under a bit of stick now, you know, it's another another year the Champions League has passed them by. Do they then kind of go, look, Premier League, okay, grand, but deep down like if they win the Premier League, will this season be a disappointment? Um, I think it will deep down. He won't admit it. I th- listen, it, even he said it. You know, hasn't said it in recent weeks, but in months gone past about the Champions League and how important it was. And I think was it last season where he said they'd swap, like Liverpool wanted the Premier League and they wanted the Champions League. You know, the, either team would swap with each other. So he's obviously making a point of it. He hasn't won it in a long time. For you know, everyone talks about Pep Guardiola, the, the best manager in the world, and changed football and this, that, and the other. And he's. He's the connoisseur's fan, you know, manager, best ever. He's, you know, they play perfect football, but they haven't won the Champions League. He hasn't won it. He hasn't won it without Messi at Barcelona when Messi was at his peak. When I probably could have, I probably could have managed Barcelona to win the Champions League at the time, to be honest with you. Are you, David? Um, so that question mark hangs over him. Unfortunately, listen, I like him. I think he's a, obviously he's a very, very good manager, but you still have to win the big trophies. Like, like the Carlo Ancelotti's, who probably doesn't get spoken about like Pep does, um, you know, like Mourinho even, you know, he's you know won more trophies in his probably career at different clubs. Um, Pep has gone to a fantastic Bayern Munich team, and I'm not saying Mourinho is anywhere in his league at the moment, but I'm just talking about in the past. Um, Pep went to a fantastic Bayern Munich team and didn't win the Champions League, and that was their aim. They win the league every year. That wasn't a big deal. It was win the Champions League, and they didn't do it. So the same things happened in Man City. They spent a hundred million on one player in the summer, and Jack Grealish didn't really get the best out of him this season. They've gone and spent another gazillion on Haaland. Uh, you know, money is not the problem. He can sign who he wants. It doesn't seem to be any issue. You know, who's the best striker? Okay, we want him. Pay him what he wants. He's coming in, so he can't argue with that. He's been given all the tools, um, and it's not easy. It's the best competition, and it's a knockout competition. So you, you do need a bit of luck. But over the course of five or six years, you know, you'd imagine that luck would have come his way and you can't blame luck over that length of time you can blame it over a season or two but over that length of time you would have expected them to have won it I'm sure he would have expected them to have won it so um, I feel like this Haaland is the sort of last throw the dice sort of thing and um, for him next season but it doesn't guarantee anything he's a fabulous player but he has to move countries a young person has to play in another league now God knows what his form is going to be like he looks like he's going to be unbelievable but you never know listen um Chelsea won everything and they went and signed Andrzej Shevchenko and everyone's like, how are we going to stop Chelsea now? They're the best team and they just signed Andrzej and Shevchenko for 50 million and he turned out to be useless at Chelsea. Useless in relatively speaking. He still scored plenty of goals but he wasn't what they expected so it doesn't guarantee anything signing the best. Man City are used to playing without a centre forward when he had, um, I'm rambling on a bit here, but when he had Aguero, you know, you'd say he's the ideal number nine centre forward from, he was looking for ways not to play him most of the time. You know, he wanted to play he wanted to play sort of like Liverpool, no out and out centre forward, three players who can rotate. And that's the way Man City have had their success. But it'd be interesting to see how Alan goes. I think he's a fabulous centre forward, fabulous striker. He looks the part. So see if he can do the job for him next season. 
what's it like in a squad when like like a, like a big name comes in, you know, like a superstar like that. Like, what happens in the squad? Do people start looking over the shoulder? Does it upset um, the apple cart? Or is it very easy that you just have the superstar come yeah. in and slot? Well, in fairness, in Man City, there's probably 20 superstars. So it's all right. Where, um, it, it's more like his mindset when he comes in. As long as he comes in and this and works hard and does the job for him, he'll be accepted. If he comes in and acts like I am the superstar and I'm better than all ye, well, then it'll soon cause... Uh, some problems, but I listen. I don't know. Don't know what his personality is like. Uh, he looks a confident young man, so um, it'll be interesting to see how he deals with it. Um, he's been listen fabulous today in his career. So, um, but yeah, he was the superstar in Germany. But he's coming into a squad of, you know, he's not going to be ahead of Kevin De Bruyne in the superstar status, or you know, wow. he could list off a few players there at Man City. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, who is does he want to be that sort of top dog and and sort of lay down his markers he come in and just be that team player which Man City are a bunch of in fairness to them there's no you know doesn't look like there's any prima donnas there it does look like they all as much as superstars that they all work hard together and they are on equal footing and, a, and obviously a very good team you, you've moved around a bit and kind of been the new signing and come, what, what's it like day one <laughs> when you roll in is it like um, first day of school <laughs> Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It is. You're listen. You're walking in like anything. I went to Wolves as their record signing. Um, and yeah, first of all, like even walking in like anything, new job. Where am I sitting in the dressing room? Where's you know all those things? Um, you know, you feel like a baby again. Um, and then the pressures on you, especially like having the big signing. Um, and the pressures on you in the first training session, even because you know, you listen. You're might feel like crap or whatever, but you have to try to perform your first training session until you feel like people are watching your every touch and every move for the first few weeks. Um, and listen, it makes you, it makes you make sure you're on the ball. I do remember sp specifically in the first few months that Wolves, I actually got injured in preseason there and I felt more pressure again because I missed the first few games of the season, but it, it made me knuckle down and make sure I was right and came back right and uh, was as fit as I could be. I, I ended up having a very good first season at Wolves, but yeah, definitely focused the mind and body. Yeah, and when you look at a bit of focus, there's a couple of teams now down the bottom. Um, maybe Everton have kind of pulled through a uh, couple of wins. Yeah, Didn't beat Watford, probably kicking themselves for that. Uh, I think if they had got that win, they really would have arguably cemented their, their, themselves yeah. in the league. Um, people are now looking at Leeds. You know, when you look at them against, what was it, Chelsea the other night, they were sending off pretty early. Like, even at that stage, you know, you can't even keep 11 players on the pitch and you're in a relegation battle. How do you see it going? Are Leeds the one now that are probably favourite to drop? Yeah, they're definitely favourites. Listen, you don't know. They have two sort of okay games. They could get something out of them. Um, the one thing that worry me is not losing to Chelsea. Is that tackle you mentioned early in the game. It just looked like a frustrated sort of, you know dangerous obviously but just a terrible frustrated lazy sort of tackle that you know when you're in such a situation you need to be 11 men on the pitch against Chelsea that that would worry me sort of the, psych, the psychology of the players there at Leeds whatever must be going through their head um, yeah their favourites it doesn't look great for them you know Everton in fairness to Frank Lampard I know they didn't beat Watford but at least they didn't lose it's another point it could be a very important point so um, and Burnley second their manager picked up their few wins you know, I, I, I think it's between Burnley and Leeds. I think Everton have enough and they have a, a game in hand as well over the other two. So I think they'll be able to stay up. And then what can Burnley do? And can Leeds and those two sort of, I suppose, winnable, not as winnable, but the two easier than they've had in recent weeks' games. Isn't they played Man City and, and um, Chelsea in their last two games? Not, not ideal for them at this stage of the season, but two games that aren't quite as difficult coming up. So again, like the top of the table, there could be a twist. But if you had to pick one, I think like everyone, I don't see anyone right now who wouldn't pick Leeds, but could change, change this weekend. And Burnley might be the one we're all talking about next week. Yeah, it's interesting like because Leeds made the managerial change as they all have done who are in that kind of battle. But, you know, hearing the, the new manager, the Leeds manager's name has just escaped me, but he, um, it's almost like, you know, a rallying call to the fans, you know, because I think he can, he can understand the frustration. You get a sense of that. But like, in those moments, is there anything that can be said? Like, like what? Like, you've been in a few scraps, you know, like, and we've talked about this before, but when it comes down to literally, you know, two games left, you need points. Are you searching? Are you, you know, is it a case that you start questioning everything? 
or do you stick to what you know and just hope that you can get something? Um, yeah, it's too late to change, but I probably the less talking the better because you know everyone will want to have their say and everyone will have an opinion and it'll end up in a load of differing nonsense in a meeting. So it's better off, you know, I've been in that situation and you'd have a million team meetings and this, that, and the other and end up getting nothing from them. You know, you're probably better off. The less bed said, the better. Stick to the basics. Um, a little bit of a rallying speech, I suppose, for 10 seconds, but none of the nonsense and just get on with it, lads. And you either stay up or you don't sort of thing. You know, at this stage, if you're trying to change things and find things with two games to go, there'll have been umpteen bonding sessions and, you know, away days and, you know, army drill sessions, whatever it might be to try, you know, go-karting sessions. You always know you're in trouble when the team is organising a go-karting session because <laughs> they're trying to do a bit of bonding. Um, you know, when you see those things coming up on the timetable for the team, you know you're in a bit of, you're in a bit of trouble. So, listen, the less said, the better. Get on the training pitch, do your work, get home and win at the weekend. And that would be my team talk to the, to the players. Um, you know, be professional, rest up, win at the weekend. That's all you can do. Never mind the, the nonsense sort of... I suppose, shite talk that goes on around it. Yeah. Is there any, like, you know, when you think back to those moments, like, who who gave you, a, a, like, a brilliant rallying call? Like, we, we always look back. What's the one? Um, Al Pacino. Um, oh, come on. Help me. What is it? Um, any given Sunday. Yeah. Six inches in front of your face, you know? Yeah. Like, is there any of those moments in your career where it's, you know, like the the, the passion or or, or um, else someone get up and give it this big gun and just falls flat in his face? Yeah. Um, oh, I remember Dean Saunders. You know, we'd gone through a few managers at Wolves at the time, but Dean Saunders got the job. And I can't remember exactly, but he did give us one of those rallying cry speeches. And it was quite impressive at the time, but I think we went out and lost at the weekend. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, no, it didn't last long either. We were, or, you know, probably wasn't his fault, but we were in a bad spell at Wolves and we'd gone through it. He could have been our fourth manager in about a year. So, yeah. but he gave us a very passionate speech, got everyone into the canteen and gave a big speech. And, and one of those, listen, you're either with me or you're out here, sort of one of those ones. Uh, um, yeah, I just remember it didn't work. <laughs> um, yeah, no, he was good. At, he was good fun, actually, Dean Saunders. He was good fun around the place. It wasn't for lack of uh, morale and training and things like that. He brought, he definitely brought that to it. But um, yeah, I do remember his speech falling flat. But anyway, listen, it would have been anyone, I think, at the time where we were in, in uh, at, at Wolves. And look, the season's coming to an end. Um, and I suppose sometimes you kind of always come to the end and you kind of look at the international kind of setup. And obviously, we're not going to be involved. Well, this autumn or winter, whenever it's going to be on. But, you know, from an Irish perspective and, you know, Stephen Kenny, like, is there any Irish players that really kind of excelled or really kind of stood out for you? I know we've probably, there's not too many uh, that we can kind of pick from. Um, no. And, you know, our captain is in a relegation battle. Um, but then anyone kind of that has really, you know, done well? Well, there's loads of done well, and he's given lots of people a chance. Um, I've sort of, listen, he's not, Played a whole lot for Ireland, but he scored a like fabulous goal, an important goal, and was that the last qualifying game in Troy Parrot? And he's, you know, he's. I was speaking to you last week about players who sort of have to get up and do it. You know, they have lots of potential and they have to go out and do it. And he's one that sort of seems to be coming out of the other side of a bad spell, and has fabulous ability. Was probably at his age group in Europe the best player in Europe at under nineteen level. Um, wow. You know, so he was. You know, talking about a really person with a real potential. Um, and went through a few years, a lot of pressure on him with Ireland and a lot of pressure on people expecting him to just, you know, jump straight into a first team of Spurs or get in the Ireland squad or the Ireland team. But he seems to have gone through a bit of a, a patch of finding himself and come out at club level and has got a few goals Um, scored a really good goal for, it was the last game, I think, for Ireland. Fabulous strike. And, you know, it could be an important player for us, not blessed with a million centre forwards. And if he keeps developing... um. It's an option, a goal scorer, and works hard, holds the ball up, has a, a good all-round game. Um, that's some the younger side of things. Um, and I've liked like Shane Duffy came from horrible experience at Celtic and to come back and you know be look like he's confidence back, have a good season, and get really important player in the Ireland squad again. So um, from the experience side of things, great for the manager. The manager stuck with him when he was under pressure from all of us, and me, I suppose, included, questioning whether he should or shouldn't. And he did stick with him, and he's been rewarded for that. And Shane is. Obviously, he had to do that work himself as well. So good to see that, because um, he's a really good player when he's when he's on his 
on his day. He's a he's a very good centre half, and we need we need him. Yeah, and again, that environment um, that they have in Brighton seems to be like it's a winning formula this year. They've done very very well. Um, and Paris, like I'm just looking here, like it's still only twenty. Yeah. Um, and probably a good decision to go out on uh, or go down to Milton Keynes, MK Don. Yeah, he's who, had a few loans. And one or two yeah. of them worked out, and now he's started to like we're talking about Aaron Connolly last week, and he needs to sort of become a professional and, and have a long. Troy Parrott's gone out now and started to look like play games weekly and, and maybe contribute and score some goals and not just be the the future or the potential. You have to actually fulfil that, and it looks like he might just be starting to do that. Yeah, excellent, and we hope that they continue that, and we get a few more names and people up to that level as well. Um, time for our one-two free bet segment. Uh, it's now time uh, your chance to win a hundred euro cash are absolutely free. All you have to do is predict the scores of three of this weekend's matches. Kevin, what are your one-two free predictions for this weekend? Okay, so our first game is Spurs at home to Burnley. Um, I am going to go for. A oh, Spurs home to Burnley. I think Burnley's bubble might get burst in this one. I go for a Spurs home win 2 0. 2 0 to Spurs. Next up is West Ham at home to Man City. Can this be the one? Yeah. Uh, no. I'm going to go for this is the one that the little pothole in the road for Man City. I'll go for a draw. Uh, goal apiece. 1 1. Okay. And finally, Everton at home to Brentford. I think Everton win 1-0. One 1-0. Nil. One nil. Okay. There you have it. Okay. So, looking good for Everton. West Ham draw with Man City and a 2-0 win for Spurs against Burnley. Kevin, thank you for your time. Remember, if you are having a bet on anything this weekend, please do gamble responsibly. Visit gamblecare.ie for more information. We'll be back next week for more of the build-up brought to you by Labrooks.